In this final screencast on dynamic programming, we're going to look at applications of dynamic programming, have some comments about optimal substructure, and then a summary of dynamic programming. Uh, this is the dynamic coastline at Moomomi Sand Dunes on Molokai. First, we're going to look briefly at two other applications of dynamic programming, partly just so you're aware of the diversity of problems to which dynamic programming can be applied as a strategy and also because these are important problems. Uh, the first one we'll look at is optimizing matrix chain multiplication. This is probably the most common problem used in textbooks to introduce dynamic programming. I just decided to use different ones, but you can find this uh, in our textbook or virtually any textbook. Uh, I'm just going to describe the problem here. We don't really have time to go through the solutions. Uh, so in many scientific and business applications, you have to multiply chains of matrices, you know, like A1 times A2 times A3 uh, N. And uh, matrix multiplication is associative, uh, so you have a choice. Uh, you could decide, say, to uh, multiply the first two and then multiply the result of that by the next one and just continue in that manner. Um, or you could do it differently. You could decide to multiply the last two and then start adding on the ones before it. Um, or you could do something completely differently. You could do knock off pairs and then uh, after you've gotten all the pairs start multiplying those pairs by each other uh, and so on. And you can you can see that there's uh, quite a number of possible combinations in fact an exponential number of combinations of uh, possible ways of multiplying uh, the matrices. The order in which you multiply matrices makes a big difference because um, if you have a P by Q matrix and a Q by R matrix, uh, these have to match in order to be able to multiply them. The, the total cost to multiply is P times Q times R, and we can see with the simple examples uh, that it matters. For example, let's say we have um, A and we have C, which is a 100 by 20 matrix, and we choose to multiply say a times b first so a times b is going to re cost 2 times 100 times uh, 100 okay is 20,000 to cost but then we have to multiply the result of that oh this by the way gives a uh, 2 by 100 matrix you get the um, the outer two um, dimensions of the size of the resulting matrix and now we're going to multiply this 2 by 100 matrix uh, by C. So the AB result times C will cost 2 times 100 times C's third dimension, which is 20, which is going to give us 4,000. And so the uh, total number of multiplications needed is 20, sorry, 24,000, adding these two numbers. But what if we decided to multiply uh, B times C first? we would have cost uh, 100 by 100 by by 20 and that's going to cost us 200,000 multiplications and then when we when we do the um, a times the bc bc result we will have to pay the cost of 2 times uh, the size of this matrix which is a um, 100 by 20 matrix so 2 times 100 times 20 is another 4,000 and so our total is 204,000 rather than 24,000 matrix multiplications. Now it's important to be clear that the dynamic programming is not doing the matrix multiplications. It's just figuring out what's the optimal order in which to multiply the matrices. Regular matrix multiplication programming is applied to do the multiplication. Uh, and also, I was able to figure out by hand, within uh, several minutes of computation here, which order is better for multiplying three matrices. But as you can see with my example up here, as soon as the, you know, the number of matrices get large, the number of possible combinations, orders you can do it, gets very large. It grows quickly. Uh, so that's why it's worth doing dynamic programming to figure out what order to multiply your matrices before you uh, actually run the job. So you can go to the text to see how dynamic programming solves the uh, matrix chain optimization problem. But we can see fairly quickly that why dynamic programming would apply. Kind of like the cut rod problem, uh, one strategy to consider is, let's say, let's pick a place to cut it. 
and uh, we're going to figure out what it costs to multiply those matrices together and then we're going to find the optimal solution to this and then we'll figure out the cost to multiply those two halves but you could just as well decide you know to cut it here and so you're going to have to solve for this sub problem and this sub problem or you could cut it here and solve for this sub problem and this sub problem um, but notice that all three of these cuts would require computing the cost of uh, solving this sub problem and all the cuts from here onwards would require computing the optimal solution to that sub problem uh, and all the, the cuts uh, from here onwards would require computing the optimal solution to that sub problem uh, so you can see why dynamic programming applies. We'll just compute the solution to each of those sub problems once we'll put them in a table and we're going to try all the different ways um, at the top level of breaking up the matrices but we're never going to redo the computations for the um, sub problems there. So it can be shown as is shown in the text that the brute force approach of considering all combinations is omega of 2 to the n, it's exponential in the n, and uh, doing it this way is going to be order of n cubed with n squared space required to store the table, which is much better than exponential. Another application is to optimal binary search trees. Now we know that if we insert keys into a regular binary search tree, not a red-black tree, but just a regular binary search tree, in uh, an unfortunate order, uh, say we have the keys A, B, C, let's go up to G here, and we happen to insert them in a tree in that order under the usual lexical ordering, uh, of course you're going to get a tree that looks like this, which will be linear to search. Now we know that if we uh, have all the keys in advance, uh, there's a simple procedure that's kind of based on binary search to uh, construct a balanced binary tree from this. You just would um, dive into the middle, choose the middle element for the root, and then recurse on the two halves, uh, and you would get something like this. Uh, you know, recursing on the two halves, of course, dive in the middle, you get a B, dive in the middle, you get an F, and those are going to be the children. So there's a quick way to make a nice balanced um, binary search tree if you have all the keys in advance but this assumes that all keys are equally likely to be accessed. Suppose you had a frequency table that said for example well E is the most common letter in the alphabet but we've pushed it way down to the bottom of the tree here. Uh, if we we're searching for letters for example we might want to put E up at the root or at least closer to the root to make um, its access faster. Uh, so suppose we have a table of frequencies of, of keys and then we want to construct the key, uh, sorry, construct a binary search tree that minimizes the cost across all the keys to search for them. The strategy, the overall strategy is fairly simple. Uh, we're going to try all possible nodes here being the root and then we'll recursively solve the problem. So one thing we'll do is we will consider, you know, what if D is the root and then we will find the optimal solution for these two subtrees. But we'll also do it for all the other ones. So if, for example, one choice would be what if E is the root and now let's recurse on these two as subproblems. And of course you can see that both of those choices involve uh, F and G as a subproblem of both of them. So again we use the tables to store the uh, optimal solutions to subproblems. Uh, the same would be true for A, B, and C is going to be a subproblem of both D, the root and E the root. Uh, so we'll store those in tables so we don't have to recompute them. Uh, I recommend reading the um, discussion of optimal binary search trees in the chapter. It's a very nice um, development of an algorithm from analyzing the recursive structure of the problem. And, and that's really the point here is that you you need to understand how they derive these things because the point is not to memorize the solution. The point is to understand how analyzing the optimal substructure of a problem will uh, lead to you understanding what the algorithm should be. So as we move to the dynamic coastline of Makena on Maui, uh, we're going to look now at optimal substructure and some issues in determining the optimal substructure of a problem. So to use dynamic programming, we have to show that any optimal solution involves making a choice that leaves one or more subproblems to solve, and the solutions to the subproblems used within the optimal solution must also themselves be optimal. That's optimal substructure. But here's some complications. The first issue is that we don't know the optimal choice in advance um, because obviously we're trying to write something to solve the problems and uh, we don't know what that choice is. But the strategy we take here 
is we assume that the choice has been made optimally and then show if that choice has been made optimally then the result must have a certain structure and we often often make this argument using a cut and paste proof by contradiction where if there was a suboptimal uh, subproblem we could uh, cut it out and paste in a more optimal one uh, then when we write the code we have to make sure that we cover all the uh, potential alternatives uh, that's why we often have uh, you know iterate over things and find the min or the max of all the choices according to some objective function that you've seen in all the examples the next issue is that optimal st substructure varies across problem domains and this is why again dynamic programming is not a single method of solving problems it's an approach to analyzing problems and then figuring out how to solve them by storing uh, solutions to smaller problems and building up solutions to bigger ones. Uh, so we can look at three examples here in terms of how many subproblems are used in an optimal solution, how many choices we have to make to determine which subproblems to use, and the resulting runtime. So I'm going to write up a little table here. So let's consider the number of subproblems in the optimal solution and how many choices you have to consider to find them for rod cutting these common subsequence and optimizing a binary search tree. Uh, for rod cutting, you have uh, one sub-problem um, that's going to be of size n minus i, because uh, remember we consider chopping off at each of a, a sequence of positions and then uh, leaving one piece, the whole size, on the left-hand side of the cut and then solving just a sub-problem on the right-hand side of the cut. Uh, LCS, there's also only one sub-problem. Uh, that would be the LCS of the uh, prefix sequence. And in the optimal BST, we actually have two subproblems uh, because we've chosen some uh, case of R to be the root, and then we're going to have to solve the two subproblems of everything on the left hand side of it and everything on the right hand side of it being uh, trees that are going to be the children trees of that root. But how many choices do we have to look at to determine which subproblems to use? A uh, rod cutting, uh, you have to look at uh, n choices for each value of i. LCS, uh, we're going to have to look at uh, one choice if the x of i is equal to y sub i, remember where the last character matches, or y sub j, and we're going to have to look at two choices if uh, they don't match, uh, the last character of the two subsequences don't match. And then the optimal BST, uh, we're going to have, uh, you're going to have to read the text to see why, but j minus i plus one choices uh, for a given root. So there's actually uh, many more choices to consider there. Now we also have to consider how many subproblems overall there are. Rod cutting has theta of n of them, and LCS has theta of m n of them, and optimal BST has theta of n squared of them. So the runtime is the overall runtime is the number of sub overall subproblems times the number of choices to make in each. Here we have um, n. Uh, choices, so we end up with theta of n squared, and here we have two choices, so we still end up with theta of mn, and um, here we have, um, this turns out to be um, n choices, order of n choices, and so this gives us uh, big O of n cubed for optimizing the BST. The final issue to consider is that some optimization problems don't have optimal substructure. You can't just assume it. You have to show that it's there. So for example, let's consider uh, when we study graphs, we're going to look at something called the shortest path problem. Now this does exhibit optimal substructure in that if P is in a shortest path between vertices U and V, then it must be the case that the shortest path between the start vertex and any vertex on the, along the way must also be an optimal, it must also be a shortest path. That's the optimal substructure. So the optimal solution overall, the shortest path between U and V, must involve shortest paths between the start vertex and any vertices in between in that vertex and the end vertex. So this is also an optimal solution. And you can show that if it were not, you could do a cut and paste. You could just find the shorter path and paste it in here and you'd get a shorter path, so path overall. However, the problem of longest, a simple path, does not exhibit optimal substructure. We're going to say the longest simple path because, of course, you can find a really long path just by going around cycles you know, a million times uh, before you hop somewhere. So the longest simple path uh, will be a path that doesn't do that kind of cycling. 
Uh, so let's say we wanted a longest simple path from Q to R in this graph, then you would go you know, down here, over here, over here. Now if we want the longest simple path from R to Q to S to T, this would be the longest simple path from R to T. But if you want the longest simple path from um, Q to T, you can't just compose those two paths. Uh, they wouldn't even be a legal path. So this does not exhibit optimal substructure. Let's wrap up this long series of screencasts on dynamic programming by summarizing some of the points we've made along the way that you need to remember. Uh, so when does dynamic programming apply? Well, first of all, the problem has to have recursive decomposition. You've got to break it down and be able to break it down into smaller subproblems of the same type. Now, this is also true of divide and conquer that we've already studied and greedy programs that we will study next. But dynamic programming is distinguished in that it handles overlapping subproblems in a special way. Uh, dynamic, uh, recursive decomposition uh, by divide and conquer does not handle overlapping subproblems. It will repeat, repeatedly solve the same problems over and over again, wasting computation that's already been done, whereas dynamic programming uh, handles this well. The third thing, of course, is you have to show optimal substructure to apply dynamic programming. And this is also going to be true of greedy algorithms that we're going to see next. Uh, but greedy algorithms are going to be distinguished by a different property, the greedy property. So optimal substructure means that you can use optimized recursive solutions to construct the optimized larger solution. Uh, and that lets you reuse the previous computations. And finally, we have noted that dynamic programming is a problem solving method that you uh, use, you apply to figure out the solution to specific problems, and you do that in four steps. First, you figure out the structure of an optimal solution, and you do that basically by proving that the problem has optimal substructure, and the proof will characterize in the structure of the proof itself. It'll show you what the structure of the optimal solution is. Then you write code that will actually define the value, actually you write mathematics that defines the value of an optimal solution. So you write an equation to define the value of the optimal solution, and that will be a recursive equation. It will be a cost function. And then you actually write the code to compute the value of the optimal solution. Then you uh, augment that code to uh, record the optimal choices that were made uh, to construct the optimal solution. Uh, that usually involves um, adding records to the choices made to this code and then adding a uh, output procedure in CLRS. You know, they had uh, print solution procedures or whatever you need to solve your application domain problem. Well, here we are at La Perouse Bay on Maui and at the conclusion of a long series of screencasts on dynamic programming.